the fullness of your destiny in Jesus' name. And if you receive it, can you say amen today? I'd like to give you an opportunity to make Jesus the Lord of your life. If you make him your Lord, then that means you're Lord because you told your Lord what to do. Huh? I'd like you to pray this prayer with me right now. You just, I'm just going to pray a few words and then you pray it out loud. Father God, I love you. I believe in you. I believe that you sent your son Jesus to die for me. I believe he paid the price for my sins. Please forgive me. I surrender my life to you today. Take me just the way I am and now make me what you want me to be. I believe I'm forgiven. I've been born again and I'm looking forward to my new life with you. Amen. Well, congratulations. You have just become part of the family of God. That sinner's prayer has sent more people to hell than anything on the face of the earth. Would you pray with me? Just say, Lord Jesus, I repent of my sins. Come into my heart. I make you my Lord and Savior. The scripture does not say that Jesus Christ came to the nation of Israel and said that the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Now who would like to ask me into their heart? I see that hand. It's not what it says. He said, repent and believe the gospel. I would love to have the opportunity to pray with you. I'm not here to condemn anybody, but rather to help you find a new beginning. And I know that comes through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Why don't you pray with me today? Just say, Lord Jesus, I repent of my sins. Come into my heart. Wash me clean. I make you my Lord and Savior. Friend, if you prayed that simple prayer, we believe you got born again. Now, at this particular point, um, you would say to someone, I'm telling you, you need to be born again. And if the person said to you, how do I do that? You would say, ah, oh, pray this prayer, right? Repeat after me. Pray this prayer. Oh, well, you just need to repent and believe. What did Jesus say to Nicodemus? The really strange thing. Verse 8, the wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but do not know where it comes from and where it's going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. What, a, what is that? Hello everyone, this is John Henry with the Gospel of Christ and welcome back to a new video. If this is your first time on the channel, I invite you to subscribe and click the bell button to be notified each time we upload a new video. In this video, we have Paul Washer, Vody Bakum, and John MacArthur. So let's get right to it. Ye must be born again here in America because of the last several years, several decades of evangelism. The idea of born again is totally lost. It only means that at one time in a crusade, you made a decision and you think you were sincere. But there's no evidence of a supernatural recreating work of the Holy Spirit in your life. If any man, not if some men, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. And now, it's the same today. What do we face? I'll tell you what we face. It's not a sort of infant baptism necessarily most of the time. It's not a high church confirmation by an ecclesi ecclesiastical authority. What we face is the sinner's prayer. And I'm here to tell you, if there's anything I've declared war on, it's that. You say, Brother Paul, yes, in the same way that infant baptism, my opinion, was the, was the golden calf of the Reformation, for the Baptists and the Evangelicals and everyone else who's followed them today, I'll tell you, that sinner's prayer has sent more people to hell than anything on the face of the earth. You say, how can you say such a thing? Go with me to Scripture and show me, please. I, I would love you to stand up and tell me where anyone evangelized that way. The Scripture does not say that Jesus Christ came to the nation of Israel and said that the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Now, who would like to ask me into their heart? 
I see that hand. It's not what it says. He said, repent and believe the gospel. Now men today are trusting in the fact that at least one time in their life they prayed a prayer and someone told them they were saved because they were sincere enough. And so in their salvation, if you ask them, are you saved? They do not say, yes, I am because I'm looking unto Jesus and there is mighty evidence giving me assurance of being born again. No, they say, one time in my life I prayed a prayer. And they live like devils. But they prayed a prayer. And some of them, I heard of one evangelist who was coaxing a man to do that thing. Find the man felt so uncomfortable, the evangelist said, well, I'll tell you what, I'll pray to God for you. And if it's what you want to say to God, squeeze my hand. Behold the power of God. Decisionism. The idolatry of decisionism. Men think they're going to heaven because they have judged the sincerity of their own decision. When Paul came to the church in Corinth, he did not say to them, look, you're not living like Christians, so let's go back to that one moment in your life and when you prayed that prayer and let's see if you were sincere. No, he said this, test yourselves, examine yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Because I want you to know, my friend, salvation is by faith alone. It is a work of God. It is a grace upon grace upon grace. But the evidence of conversion is not just your examination of your sincerity at the moment of your conversion. It is the ongoing fruit in your life. It is the ongoing fruit in your life. Oh, my dear friend, look what we've done. Is it a tree known by its fruit? What, 60, 70 percent of America thinks it's converted, born again? We kill how many thousands of babies a day? We're hated around the world for our immorality, yet we're Christian. And I lay, lay this squarely, the blame, at the feet of the preacher. At the center of the gospel is the person and work of Christ. It's the person and work of Christ. It is not an I gospel. I didn't choose Jesus. Jesus chose me. Amen? I didn't find Jesus. Jesus found me. Huh? Amen? I didn't make Jesus my Lord. If you make him your Lord, then that means your Lord because you told your Lord what to do. Huh? You acknowledge Jesus' lordship. You don't bequeath lordship on Jesus any more than you bequeath kingship to a king. King, I'm going to make you my king. Really? Because I've been your king. How are you going to make me your king? I'm the king. Who do you think you're talking to? Away with this one. Huh? Jesus is Lord. You acknowledge that. You receive that. You bow to that. You, you don't make that happen. You don't declare that. Huh? In your repentance and faith, you repent of your sin. And part of your sin is a failure to acknowledge the Lordship of Christ. He is Lord. And everyone will acknowledge that. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Every knee, every tongue. The gospel is Christ-centered. Jesus knew there was a question in the heart of Nicodemus that Nicodemus hadn't verbalized, and so he went right to the heart and he said, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he can't see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he's old? Now he understands Jesus is speaking metaphorically, you need to be born again, you need to go back and start all over at the very beginning. 
It's not about religious advancement, it's about birth. So he asked the question, how, how, how can a man be born when he's old? How do I do that? How do I go back to the beginning? I'm, I'm, a, I'm an old man now and I've been in this legalism all these years, my whole life. He can't go a, center, a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? And, and he's talking metaphorically. He understands it. He's not talking physically. He's not making a joke. Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, and He's borrowing from Ezekiel, right, the new covenant passage, that uh, you need to be washed with water, cleansing, and be given a new heart to replace the stony heart. So He's talking Ezekiel talk to a teacher of the Old Testament. You need new covenant experience. You need what even Jeremiah 31 talks about. You need to be cleansed and you need to have a new heart. You need to have the Spirit planted within you before you can enter the kingdom of God. That's the new covenant. You need to, you need to be regenerated. You need to be transformed because that which is born of the flesh is flesh and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Your flesh and you're just continuing to continue the process of the flesh until you go back to the very beginning are born again spiritually by the Holy Spirit, then you can enter the kingdom of God. So don't be amazed that I say you must be born again. Now at this particular point, um, you would say to someone, I'm telling you, you need to be born again. And if the person said to you, how do I do that? You would say, ah, oh, pray this prayer, right? Repeat after me. Pray this prayer. Oh, well, you just need to repent and believe. What did Jesus say to Nicodemus? The really strange thing. Verse 8, the wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but do not know where it comes from and where it's going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. What, a, what is that? If somebody came to you and said, I, I think I need to be born again, I think I need to get out of this uh, sort of relentless uh, life of the flesh, I, I need a new birth, I need a new heart, I need a new spirit, what do I do? Would you say to them, you can't do anything, you can't do anything. This is the work of the Spirit and He comes and goes when He wills on whom He wills. What? So much for formula evangelism, so much for pray this prayer. This is Jesus. This is not some novice who doesn't quite get evangelistic technique. This is Jesus. What He's saying to Nicodemus is, I, I just have to tell you, you need to be born again. You need to be born anothen, literally from above, and you're not in charge of when that happens. What a statement. I recognize what you need. I also recognize that you are not in charge of its reality. Wow. Spirit comes and goes as He wills. And that's why people are born of the Spirit. You see, that, that, that may be the most overlooked statement in Scripture on divine sovereignty in salvation. Wow, divine sovereignty, you can't argue that. But um, let's, let's look a little further into this chapter, okay? Come down to verse 27. John the Baptist is also a Calvinist. He didn't know that because very few Baptists are. <laughs> Listen to what John said. Verse 27, a man can receive what? What's the next word? Nothing unless it has been given him from heaven. You can't receive anything unless it comes down from heaven. Yeah, John knew that. And John is the last of the Old Testament prophets. 
Divine sovereignty, absolutely. In salvation, it's a divine work. It's a work that heaven does. Now let's go back to verse 15. Are you ready for this? So that whoever believes will in Him have eternal life. What? What's that whoever doing there? Whoever believes will in Him have eternal life. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God didn't send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be judged through Him. He who believes in Him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Why are people judged and go to hell? Because they aren't elected? No, because they don't believe. This is the judgment that light has come into the world, and men loved the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light, doesn't come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed, but he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifest as having been wrought in God." Drop down to verse, um, well, verse 36. He who believes in the Son has eternal life. He who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. The eternal wrath of God falls on people because they do not, what? Believe. Are you having a little trouble putting that all together? Good. Because you need to have that trouble. That means you understand both. Don't find some middle ground that wipes out both of these truths. The so-called sinner's prayer is, as Paul Washer stated, a straight puddle to hell uttered from the very pulpit of the so-called American churches. As you could have noticed, at the end of Austin's and Myers' prayers, they automatically welcome you into the family of God. If you prayed that simple prayer, we believe you got born again. Well, congratulations, you have just become part of the family of God. As if the prayer itself is the agent, the catapult, as it were, that shoots you right into the kingdom of God. Not to mention the distorted notion of making Jesus your Lord. As if Jesus is that Lord, regardless we accept or acknowledge Him as Lord. All of this stems from a major misunderstanding of who Christ is and the gospel. If you think about it, the same person who prayed that prayer and made Jesus their Lord can, based on that same logic, at some point dethrone Jesus as their Lord. In other words, as Vodi said, they are ultimately Lord over Jesus since they tell Him when He can and cannot be Lord over their life. Lastly, this prayer completely disregards the sovereignty of God in salvation. Salvation is by and of the Lord. He is the author of it all from end to end. Are you responsible to come? Yes. Are you told to believe? Yes. And yet, the entire work of salvation is of God. That is what theologians call monergism. Many people who are saved can testify that they did pray the sinner's prayer. However, they were not saved because of the sinner's prayer, but in spite of it, no prayer can redeem man who's dead, trespasses in sin, and totally and completely unwilling and unable to choose God. Ephesians 2 verse 4 says, but God. Thank the Lord for the buds in the Bible. And at this moment, I would like to kindly invite you to subscribe to our channel if you love our content and help us share and spread the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if you are just stopping by and made it this far in the video, well, thank you for watching. I hope you are encouraged and I hope to see you in our next video with Love in Christ, John Henry with the Gospel of Christ.